So what I wanted to talk about today is our Nebraska climate and how that affects trees. We are seeing more extreme weather events and it's doing a lot of damage to our urban canopy and also our rural canopy. So I just wanted to, can everybody see that okay? I just wanted to run through a couple things like um, winter weather and how our snow and ice loads affect trees along with uh, temperature extremes. <laughs> then I want to talk about um, moisture, how excessive moisture affects root systems and how that plays into fungal disease uh, development. Uh, tree physiology, um, I'm going to throw out terms like respiration, photosynthesis, transpiration, but I'll try to cover the basics on those and how that gets interrupted during our extreme weather events. And then of course drought. Drought has played a big role in the last couple of years in how our trees are surviving. So let's get started. Winter Storm Kayla 2016, Groundhog Day. We saw some excessive snow. Grand Island had 18 inches. Uh, Hastings had about 16 inches and of course it tapered off and Omaha and Lincoln maybe got half a foot. So I'm a numbers girl and I'm also a visual girl, so I don't really know how much snow weighs, so I kind of wanted to figure that out. This is what Grand Island looked like. I don't know if you guys have seen this picture on the internet, um, but somebody took a, a picture outside of their door and, and drifts were six feet high. So how much does that weigh? How much is that affecting um, our trees? One cubic foot of water is about 62 pounds. Still, I don't know what that means. I can't visualize 62 pounds in my head. So I had to search the internet and a gentleman did some calculations already for me. And fluffy snow weighs about seven pounds per cubic foot. Middle of the road, 15 pounds per cubic foot. Drifted and compacted snow weighs 20 pounds or more per cubic foot. Still, I'm not sure I quite understand um, how heavy that is. So I also found a gentleman in New York State who carved out a cubic foot of snow and weighed it for me. And this cubic foot of snow is over 24 pounds. It's a lot of weight. He then did the calculations of how much snow was on his roof that day and it was over 6,000 pounds. So he had an elephant standing on his garage, basically. How much does ice weigh? I didn't do the calculations on this, but I know water expands when it freezes, so it's just a little bit lighter, and I think it's about 57 pounds per cubic foot. So still a lot of weight when you think about it. <clears throat> Trees prone to breakage from ice and snow, there are some characteristics that make them prone to breakage. And we're looking at trees with fine branching, included bark, uh, multiple leads, soft wood, trees that have been topped, dead, dying trees, and damaged trees. You, you guys have probably seen this several times. This is, where's my pointer? This is a Bradford pear that had, of course, multiple leads, included bark, and it just snapped right there. Pretty damaging. Trees prune on one side, you, you've messed up the, dis, the weight distribution on that tree. That's something else to think about when, when you do some pruning. So just a very short list of a long list of trees that are more prone to breakage. Of course, Bradford pear. You have multiple leads, included bark, susceptible to damage. Silver maple doesn't compartmentalize well, a lot of rot in there, multiple leads, just snaps with all that weight. Siberian American elm, willow, river birch, basswood, and the list goes on and on. Can you guys think of any more that, that would be prone to breakage that you've seen a lot in the last couple of years? No? Feel free to just jump in whenever. A comment. Yes. Is it, maybe, is it a good thing in a way that it's sort of self-pruning? Yes and no. It depends on where the tree is actually. So if you have um, a linden on the corner of a street and it has really bad structure and that's, that snowstorm comes through, I mean, worst case scenario, you're hitting a child that's riding his bike. 
So, you know, just depends on where it's at and how, how well it's been pruned. Because some of these trees actually can have really good structure. Um, sometimes they don't. So, did that answer your question? Okay. This is an elm that was topped and you can see the sprouting coming out. This was in 2002. Five years later, snow and ice came through, and if you guys can see that okay, um, <coughs> that branching is snapped in some cases. Top tree's not good. We know that already. I'm gonna see if you guys can see this very well. This is a video I found on the internet love videos on the internet by the way and this is a gentleman that lives in Oklahoma there was an ice storm that went through last November really bad ice storm and he has two willows on his property that he's pruned himself ice storm video um, too and there is definite breakage That's and my pergola damage for the solar panels Graham do you think that this will work look at the tree but I want you to notice if you guys can see it unfortunately it might be rough um, been the structure of the morning. tree, what type of tree it is, it how it was pruned, yeah. and maybe think about what's going to happen to those trees in the future if it continues to get ice and snow load. Let's see if we can get a close up on this bush here. Look how thick this is. Definitely don't want to be messing around trying to trim these while it's got <laughs> literally hundreds of pounds of ice built up on it. That'd just be suicidal. Look at that poor tree. It's a globe willow I planted about eight years ago, I think. Well, if it does crack, it doesn't look like it's going to hit the pergola with the solar panels, which is good. And let's get dangerous here up underneath. Let me show you some of the cracks. Look at that up there. There's a big limb in the neighbor's property right there. Oh no. This is going to be a job that someone else is going to have to do, not me. And I tried trimming a whole bunch of this before to the size of that one. Looks like my windmills are all frozen up too. Look at there. <laughs> oh my goodness. Big damage back there. Now he's standing under the tree, by the way. The fence stayed up at least. <laughs> I wouldn't do that personally. Yeah, I'm not going to stand um, underneath this tree anymore. Like I said, that's crazy. <laughs> oh my goodness. So he's going to pan over yeah, to I didn't another willow. That. <laughs> yeah, that he's I got pruned. it on video. Looks like it's about ready to crack again. See, the wind kicks up a little bit, and with all the weight up there on those leaves. Just cracks. Oh wow. Ice, ice, ice. And this little globe willow I trimmed already. <laughs> so that's good to go. Oh yeah. Look at the ice up there. You know, one thing worth pointing out if I can real sure. for a second. Um, wood is much stronger under tension than it is under yeah. compression. And so uh, when you got snow load or ice or something like that, uh, or yew bushes or whatever, uh, you may have a tendency to want to go out and, and fluff them and shake all that off. And it's really better to let that sort itself out. Because uh, the, the, the branches are already bent to a, a point where they're stressed really far. And, and shaking them around a lot is only going to cause more damage and not very likely to, to mitigate any of the damage that they're going to get. So. Um, when, when, when you have the compression side of a branch, that's, that's part of what makes them break is it's, uh, 
it's the compression side that, that's causing the problem. They usually snap on the back side because uh, the back side is, is taking all that weight. Uh, but it, you know, when, when you go out and you see a tree that seems like it's sort of uh, buckling at the base, that's why, because there's often decay in the trunk and, and the whole weight of the tree is pushing on the bowl of the tree. And that, and that compression is much harder for the tree to deal with than getting pulled, you know? So uh, all this weight plays into a compression issue. Good tip, Graham, thank you. So just something fun to watch. Um, and unfortunately, a homeowner trying to do well by his trees and not necessarily doing the right things, especially with the topping of that willow. He'll have some problems later on in that tree's life. So possible reasons for failure on those trees, of course, multi-stemmed, narrow branch crotches, possibly some included bark, fine branching, um, you know, the list goes on and on. So just something to think about. Trees resistant to ice and snow, they have better structure, uh, thicker branches, uh, narrower crowns. Young sound trees, of course, and interior forest trees because they are blocked um, by wind and snow and ice. Which gets back to that notion of how we're constantly planting trees as individuals. Yep. Wide yeah. open spaces, yeah. they don't have any protection, right? So just a couple species I picked out that are more resistant to ice and snow breakage. Of course, the list is much longer. Um, but uh, Colorado blue and Norway spruce, really good structure. Um, can get a little bushy, so there's more protection there. And uh, eastern red cedar, oak species, of course, nice hardwood, black walnut, Ohio buckeye. Ginkgo is one of my favorites, phenomenal tree, and Kentucky coffee tree. So moving on to temperature extremes, <coughs> let's see, the tail end of 2014, we had a huge drop in temperature and the whole state was affected. I remember that day. If you guys can see this okay, but York alone was 81 degrees on November 29th and dropped 71 degrees in 18 hours. That is a punch in the face to Nebraska trees. I mean, that's a semi rolling down the highway at 100 miles an hour, smacking these trees. So <clears throat> then it happened everywhere. Valentine, Hastings, I just threw up some numbers there, but you're looking at 60, 70 degree drop in a short, very short amount of time. So what happens is that the cells are actually starting to die because you have ice crystallization in the cells and your cells are dehydrating. Think of your fingers and toes when they get frostbite. I mean, your, your living tissue is dying. And then, of course, you get frost cracking. And these are even small temperature changes during the day. You get frost cracking and sun scald. This is a Myabi maple. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. But a young Myabi maple that was actually hit by um, sun scald there during that temperature change. And that tree's not doing very good. Moving on, yes. What is sun scald? Oh, sun scald, okay, if you have a tree in the winter time that um, is adjusted to those freezing temperatures and then you get a nice warm day, that sap flow, if you will, is gonna start moving a little bit faster. And then that temperature tanks at night and that's when your, your cells freeze and dehydrate and you get that blowout effect or that, that, t that tissue dye. And then underneath the bark, um, that tree will start to callus over seal. And then your, bu your bark will start sloughing off after a year or two or even sooner. Because the tissue's dead? Because the tissue's dead. But you get that from a rapid temperature change? Mm -hmm. And if you can see here by this picture, I don't know if you can see it very well, but this is the tree starting to seal over right there, and there's open, open heartwood there. I don't know if you can see that south or southwest side Yeah, the south or southwest side, that's where it gets the most uh, warming. It's, it's warmest from the sun. From the sun. Mm -hmm. Young, thin bark trees, you know, once a tree gets mature and a thicker bark to it, it's not yeah. as likely a problem. I see it the most on young maples. I'm sure there are other trees out there, but that's what I see it the most on. 
thin wood. Trees in excessive moisture. I don't know how many of you were affected by the 500 year flood in 2011 when the Missouri River flooded. I was. A lot of people on the eastern edge of the state were. Um, and this is a picture, aerial view of the Missouri River flood in 2011. <clears throat> Just some fun pictures that I hope will show up. Um, this is the South Platte River in 2013. And I'm not sure if you guys can see that, but the headwaters here are right at the Nebraska border. And I just pick, <coughs> picked on um, Roscoe, Nebraska. Two days later after the headwaters were in Colorado, this is what Roscoe, Nebraska looked like at the end of September in 2013. So those trees are inundated and completely flooded. And again, another picture of the Missouri River flood from satellite. It's not showing up very well. What does excessive soil moisture do to trees? Roots need oxygen. They need ox oxygen for all their processes, respiration especially. And respiration is you're converting your sugar to energy for metabolic processes and survival. We respirate. Um, I think it's called the carb burn. When you're exercising, your muscles are respirating. And this is the equation for respiration. You have your sugar and oxygen with energy, and it's converting to carbon dioxide and water. But you're essentially taking oxygen out of the, out of the equation. Trees cannot respirate. So Rivers and streams flood on a normal basis. That's a natural occurrence. And trees that are living next to these rivers and streams have adapted themselves for the ebb and flow of flooding. But trees in our urban communities are not adapted to flooding in the way that we flood them. So you have sprinkler systems running all the time, which creates a very detrimental condition for tree roots. So you have low oxygen, maybe some nutrient leaching depending on what type of soil you have, and root rot. This is an example of a crab apple, beautiful crab apple that was planted, and then an underground sprinkler system was installed in 2002. And I'm not sure if this is showing up very well, but two years later, the top of the tree is starting to brown. There's some leaching going on, not a lot of photosynthesis, and very short time later, the top of the tree is dead. <coughs> You're also compromising stability when you have excessive moisture. When those roots begin to rot, and the tree doesn't have to necessarily grow those roots deep enough to find water, you have a very shallow root system that's starting to rot. Well, in a high wind storm, or if you have excessive snow load, that tree is going to topple over, potentially, because it does not have its root stability anymore. Managing soil moisture is tough. I don't think a one-size-fits-all giving advice to someone on how to water a tree really works. I think it depends on your situation, what kind of soil you have, and all you need to do is just not overwater. But you have to test to see how much water you're giving that tree. You can't just set a hose there and think that you're giving it enough or, or you could potentially giving it, be giving it too much. So I usually do a screwdriver test or take my soil probe and shove it in there. And if it's going down fast enough where I might topple over, that might be too much water. But if it's hard, there's compacted soil there those roots might not be getting the water that it needs. So a good rule of thumb that people say is one inch per week applied slowly at one time or half an inch applied twice a week. I say it depends. Like I said, soil structure, what kind of water availability do you have, and just checking it out. Question? Yes. How do you, how do you define slowly? That's the thing, is how do you describe slowly to someone when their interpretation of slow might be not, not might not be mine. Slow trickle. 
Yeah. I've heard one arborist say, turn on the hose a quarter of the way and see. I like to water trees when I'm grilling. I'm already in the backyard. I can't step away for a long time and just every, every so often move it to another tree. Mm -hmm. And then just check on your progress. Take a big long screwdriver or something out there and, and poke away and see what you got. I'm a huge fan of wood chips. I know most of you here probably are. Uh, lowers temp temperature fluctuations in the soil and keeps moisture a lot longer if, if you're in drier conditions. So. Any questions, other questions about soil moisture at this time? No? Feel free to ask anything. So moisture and leaf, yes? What about the bird plant? First planting trees, like Graham said, they, they need a little bit more babying because you've taken them out of an environment and put them in a new environment. And it's also, um, how would you say this, Graham? Your roots are in one area, so it's easy probably to inundate that tree more with water in one spot than if, if that root system was going to benefit from water spreading out. So I think you have to be a little bit more careful when you water a tree, or at least watch it, to to make sure you're not flooding that hole. Does that make sense, Graham? Do you have anything yeah. to add? Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, with our with our heavy soil, sometimes you can glaze your planting hole when mm -hmm. you're digging with the shovel. You can see the shiny sort of uh, edge to the planting hole, and it creates kind of this punch bowl effect. You want to do whatever you can to rough that up so you have a you know not such a, a glazed surface uh, that's going to be hard for water to percolate back out of. And then, you know, water the soil around your planting hole as well so you don't have just this soppy yeah. area right in the middle. Some people talk about how uh, trees grown in soilless potting mix, or there's going to be an interface between that existing soil and the potting mix that doesn't always work really well with watering, and so you have to be more attentive to whether the tree. And it gets back to, you know, get a, a long screwdriver or uh, something that you can poke down in there and, and see whether you're getting gloppy muddy stuff come out, nothing at all, or somewhere in between. But yeah, well, watch the glazing on yeah. the holes. And roots are going to grow where they're most happy. So if you have a glazed hole, like Graham's talking about, and you haven't even watered the soil around that tree, you've just watered the root ball, those roots aren't necessarily going to grow out where you need them to grow. They might stay where they're most happy. Same kind of goes for soil amendments. You don't want to amend the hole that it goes in. You want to amend the area that you want the tree to grow out into. So just a top dress in the area around the planting hole is much better than trying to sweeten uh, the air, you know the backfill that you right. plant the tree with. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. So topically, if we're getting a lot of heavy rain events, leaves are not able to dry out the way they should, especially if it's more humid and you have a tree that has a lot of leaf material. So briefly, I'm just going to run through um, some fungal disease, topical, or excuse me, foliar diseases um, and moisture. So trees with common leaf diseases, if they're healthy, can survive some brief defoliation from foliar diseases. And <clears throat> rain splash and sprinkler spr splash actually causes your spores to infect that new leaf material in the spring. Trees can survive minor infections and they can even survive a complete defoliation in the year if they're healthy enough. The problem is that a lot of our Nebraska trees are not healthy enough to survive some of these things. So like I said, unhealthy or stressed trees are not going to be able to fight off those infections. And trees low in defense compounds might have severe stress if the, the leaves are lost throughout the year, year after year reoccurring. <clears throat> when we're talking in terms of photosynthesis, how do I want to say this? Photosynthesis, sugar is one of the products of photosynthesis, so glucose. Glucose actually helps produce those defense compounds in trees. So when you're lowering your photosynthesis because you don't have the leaf material, your fungal disease has made that tree defoliate, 
your defense compounds go down and your trees cannot defend off other things. So it's just a, a vicious circle, really. If you guys can see that, okay. There's the equation for photosynthesis. Oops. And you're eliminating your carbon dioxide that, that the, the leaves take up and your light energy. Just a couple of diseases I saw last year because the increase in moisture, not something I usually see on a regular basis is oak anthracnose and oak leaf blister. I actually saw oak leaf blister out in western Nebraska and they hardly ever get enough rain to have really severe leaf diseases. So I thought it was really interesting that oak blister showed itself in western Nebraska. And of course you probably have all seen crab apple rust, hawthorn rust really inundated last year. And there's your secondary hosts, eastern red cedar and juniper for that. The reason I want to talk about rhizosphere and stigmina is because I see a lot of this in lawns where there is heavy sprinkler activity. When you have a blue spruce that's low to the ground and that sprinkler is hitting it multiple times a week, those needles never dry out and it creates a real humid condition. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but that's what rhizosphere and stigmina look like on, on a needle. You see these black fruiting body dots there. And this isn't showing up very well. But a blue spruce will start to turn brown on the inside and lose its needles <clears throat> if it's infected. So a lot of times you'll see in these yards where a blue spruce is growing nice and beautiful and there'll be these bottom branches that are bare and these little pom-pom tufts at the end. That's usually rhizosphera and they're using their sprinklers too much. Can they recover from it? I've, I've had spruce trees but it happens to, you know, I've got a lot of them mm -hmm. that's one of them the same. They never seem to recover once they get it. Do well, they ever recover from it? Not really. Um, once those needles are lost it's hard to recover the, the best that can happen is the tree will start to fill in from the outside in. So if you can get those new needles protected from infection, probably with copper sulfate spray or some, some fungicide rated for rhizosphera, then that tree can start to fill back in. Because what's essentially happening is those older needles that haven't dropped out, off yet are still infected and they're infecting the new growth. Well, these particular trees, they don't get, they don't get um, water or very little, so mm -hmm. they're in the shade. So mm -hmm. really Same thing. Don't dry out. Yep, just not drying There's out very well. part of that equation missing, you know, with the light, the light energy rather than water or carbon dioxide. But not, again, mm -hmm. enough blue crust maybe to make these compounds. What's that? I'm sorry. I said the same thing you said before, if they're in the shade, maybe not getting enough photosynthesis. Right. Make, so not enough light energy, mm -hmm. so they're not able to photosynthesize well. So the tree is in the wrong spot? Yes, okay. potentially. I'd have to see what, what you got going on there. And some, some people will cut their spruce trees up, so you got a lolly, lollipop tree, and that does lower your infections a little bit because it starts from the bottom up. I don't rec recommend cutting spruce trees from the bottom up, but it does happen. So That's all I'm going to say about that. So let's move on to drought. Drought has been a huge problem the last couple years, and this is what the state looked like at the first part of October 2012. The entire state was in drought. I'm not sure if you can see the differentiation in color, but most of the state was an exceptional drought big problem for our trees. The fortunate thing is that as of last October most of us were out of the drought. Huge improvement. And I'm going to play another video on transpiration. How do water and minerals get to the leaves? Although roots can exert a slight upward pressure, it is evaporation of water from leaves, a process called transpiration that moves water molecules and ions up from the roots. Transpiration exerts a pull that is relayed downward along a string of water molecules from leaf to root. 
Hydrogen bonds cause water molecules to stick together, a phenomenon called cohesion. As each water molecule evaporates, it pulls on the next water molecule and it pulls on the next. This relays the pull of evaporating water molecules all the way down to the roots. The adhesion of water to walls of the xylem cells helps to keep gravity from pulling the water molecules back down. As each water molecule escapes from the leaf, it pulls a column of water molecules upward. Solutes are transported along with the water. Thus, the plant xylem uses the movement of evaporating water molecules, cohesion, and adhesion to draw water and dissolve minerals from the soil into its roots and upward to its leaves. Hot, dry, windy conditions increase transpiration. If not enough water moves up from the soil to replace the water lost to evaporation, the plant will wilt and it could die. How does a plant prevent excessive water loss? An opening in a leaf is called a stoma. Stomata are generally open during the day to allow carbon dioxide into the leaf, where it is used in photosynthesis. While the stomata are open, water moves out of the leaf by transpiration. This allows the plant to move water and minerals to the leaf, and the evaporation of water also functions to cool the plant. If hot, dry conditions require the plant to conserve water, guard cells close the stomata. This is a trade-off. Although closing the stomata reduces water loss, this also slows down photosynthesis and may cause the plant to overheat. But all this is really saying is that roots uptake water and it moves up the plant. <coughs> Trees use some of that water for processing and then it cools the plant as it turns into water vapor outside the leaf. Well, during hot, dry conditions, those cells that close those openings are on standby. I mean, they'll, they'll close in dry, hot conditions. Well, that's where photosynthesis is taking place. So the tree is sacrificing photosynthesis because it's too dry. It wants to conserve its water. Well, when you're lowering your photosynthesis, that's when glucose <clears throat> is used for those defense compounds. So you see this cycle again, where the tree's trying to survive and it's lowering its defenses because of that survival. Make sense? Anybody have any questions about that? So that means it values <clears throat> conserving moisture more than it does photosynthesis. That's the choice it's making. That's the choice. Yeah. That's why growth rate in a wet year goes. Growth rate in a wet year goes up. Thanks, Bob. <coughs> and in drought, your growth tanks because it's sacrificing those compounds that it gets from photosynthesis for survival. Okay. So just uh, better pictures of stomata. This is what stomata look like in your general needle. And the one on the right is what it looks like in a deciduous. Carbon dioxide is going in. Oxygen is coming out, and so is water vapor. That's transpiration. There's your xylem vessels. I just wanted to show a picture of that. So what happens when the water chain is broken in drought conditions? So you've got a water column coming up. Hydrogen atoms are bonding. Water's coming up um, against gravity. And in drought, photosynthesis is hindered. and Root systems take up air instead of water, causing these water or air pockets, excuse me. So you're breaking those chains of water columns, okay? <clears throat> this is called xylem embolism. And I don't want you to get too caught up in the terminology, and I'll try not to, to throw it at you. But that air bubble disrupts water from being uptake from the uptake of water, causing an air pocket. <clears throat> Trees can repair this damage, but it takes a long time. So if you have severe drought and you've got air, air coming up and you've got air pockets all over the place, the tree isn't going to be able to handle that as well. So the best course of action, of course, is to keep your soil moist so the tree can uptake water instead of having dry soil. 
This is a new concept for me. Water stress trees actually make noise, and I didn't know that. And for those of you that do, that's awesome. So this is just something fun. Walking in the forest, we can observe nice green living trees. But some of them die after a period of drought. Why? What happens in a tree during severe water stress? In a healthy tree, the ascending water enters by the roots, goes through the trunk, and evaporates at the surface of the leaves as the tree naturally transpires. This transpiration is the driving force that pulls the water up to the leaves. The liquid column inside a hydraulic conduit is under tension, similar to a rope that undergoes tension when pulled from the sides. During a period of drought, evaporation increases and the tension in the liquid column becomes so strong that the liquid column can break, like this rope. As a result, the conduits stop conducting the water required for the survival of the tree. Does water make sound when breaking just like the rope? Trees are not transparent, but a thin slice of fresh wood is. We take a branch from a pine tree and cut a thin slice from it. We include this slice in two transparent hydrogel slabs. This hydrogel mimics the living conditions in trees, allowing transpiration and the development of tension in the sap. The wood inclusion is placed in between microphones, and we zoom with a microscope to see what happens when the atmosphere gets drier. Since the thin layer of wood is transparent, we can now directly observe the channels. A bubble appears extremely quickly, emitting a brief sound in the ultrasonic range here with the pitch lowered to be audible. We now monitor the full sample with a camera for one hour. The size of the patches indicates the magnitude of the sound for each bubble. Thanks to these experiments, we now know what sounds are linked to water column breakages. Sound recordings could be helpful to monitor the stress in trees in order to save them from long periods of drought. So another picture just Visually, what's going on is there is your vessels of xylem. The water is moving up. That's what this dark blue is. And your embolisms are these lighter blue pockets. So you can see this embolism refilling, but it takes time. And water is diverting into other vessels. So as I've said, drought lowers the ability of the trees to photosynthesize and photosynthesis creates that glucose that's needed for defense compounds. So just briefly through uh, defense compounds, there's resins, lignin, tannins, and coumarins. Makes it very unpalpable for insects. Um, definitely has antifungal properties and makes tissue less digestible. So trees need this so that other secondary problems don't come in, um, like fungal disease and insect, uh, insect problems. So issues caused by drought specifically, you have borers, bark beetles, and canker. And I've seen a lot of this in the last couple years. So briefly, some canker that I have seen is black rot canker on fruiting apple trees. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with black rot canker. Um, but uh, usually happens during a freeze or drought and the only thing that you can do for black rock canker is cut it out and burn it in the first year. So pretty tough on trees and pretty tough to manage really. Cytospora canker you see on blue spruce a lot. Um, those branches will start to, to die back and then you'll get these uh, dead areas in the spruce tree. There is a, a canker at the tip of oak trees that I saw last year, um, and it was confused with uh, 
cicada damage, actually. So it was really tough to diagnose last year. I think that's all I have on that slide. So how to identify canker? You'll have sunken tissue, discoloration on your branches, and then sometimes you'll be able to see the fruiting fungal bodies coming out from the infection. Um, sometimes you'll get uh, an insect population that explodes because of drought. Uh, cedar bark beetles um, last year I noticed on a rancher's property he had some really huge windbreaks that were affected by drought and then he ended up having a cedar bark beetle problem because of it. I don't see a lot of cedar bark beetle in the state especially when it fluctuates like that um, but this guy all of his windbreaks are pretty much going down the tubes because of the cedar bark beetle problem. And that's just what's going to happen when you have large windbreaks or large areas where you can't get water during drought. So these are the problems you're going to have to anticipate when we have drought like that. I just wanted to run through some pictures of cedar bark beetle. Um, there's the, the galleries there. That's what the little guy looks like. tax stress trees. The adult feeds on the branches and it's not showing up very well. But I can also give you guys a copy of this PowerPoint if you would like to, um, if you want to see the pictures. Evidence of borers, you'll get thinning crowns. Um, this is bronze birch borer on a birch. The, the crown is starting to die back. And then you'll get broken tops and branches. That's Zim a picture of Zimmerman pine moth. <coughs> sap exudation, you'll start to see sap coming out of holes, um, boar poop, we call it frass. And of course the exit holes when the larvae are, are turning into adults and the adults emerge. Woodpecker activity, I know Graham and Julie have covered this before with emerald ash borer. But if you have a high density of borers in your tree, um, those woodpeckers are going to go to town. They really like it. And that's the blonding there, if you guys can see that, that Julie was talking about. Are there any bird people that know how woodpeckers find bugs in trees? I've always wondered that. Anybody? Let's figure I'd ask while we were talking. I always thought it was just like they systematically Yeah, sap suckers do sap that. Sap suckers yeah, do. Yeah. Maybe they're listening for whether there's a tunnel. You know, they can, I'm guessing maybe they tap on the tree and they can hear if there's a tunnel in there. I, I, that I makes know. sense. I just figured I'd get yeah. a I think what they do is they tap, and then when they tap, they, they hear the little thing move, the little yeah. locomotive, oh. and they uh, hmm. know where to go after. Okay. Hmm. That's interesting. I'll have to look that out. Good. So really the take home message here is that one problem can lead to another. So this locust was in a windbreak, never got any supplemental water, supplemental water during the drought. So it had insect activity, boring activity, and fungal canker and those trees are no longer alive. So drought, canker, borers, trees are goner. Um, some more take home messages, environmental issues, what I really want you to know is diversify. I know Graham talked about this a lot, but not just species, but age classes. So that way um, you're not losing your trees all at once. Some species are not hardy enough for Nebraska climates. I unfortunately don't know that well enough to tell you which species are better than others. Um, I know Justin and we have some um, articles up here that would have better lists than I do. Supplemental water during drought, no brainer. And of course one extreme weather occurrence can lead to a lot of problems. Fungal diseases, diversify. Plant trees far enough for light, light penetration and airflow so that way that, that needle material or the leaf material is drying out. Continuous wet, con wet conditions increase spore activation and infection. And of course drought can lead to a lot of problems. Treatments are not a, cu not a cure, 
for either insect or disease control. Insect problems diversify. Some insect populations fluctuate from year to year, which is sometimes a blessing. And of course, drought and other stress increases the susceptibility to insects. Now, overfertilization, this is a really interesting statement. Overfertilization or high use of insecticides increase populations of insects. Does anybody know why high fertilization rates could possibly affect your insect populations? That's insecticides, so that's a good statement. But fertilizations? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Spot on. Mm -hmm. The other thing you need to th think about about fertilizers is some commercial fertilizers are sodium based. So when you're putting a lot of sodium in your soil, water is going to leach out of your root system. Make sense? Any questions about that? And of course, treatments are not a cure. Yeah? So why is it the insecticides increase the insecticides? Oh. Insecticides increase insect activity sometimes because you're killing all of the beneficial insects that would prey upon those bad insects. But you're also killing the bad ones. Right? There's more. <laughs> huh? There's more. Yeah. Sometimes your natural predators are not in, in abundance like your, na your negative predators. So um, Oftentimes trees that get sprayed with stuff go hand in hand with trees getting fertilized a lot. And so that flush of that flush of excessive growth is going to be attractive to the, the the bad guys that you haven't killed from the spray that are nearby. You just killed all the lady beetles and all the mantids and all that kind of stuff that keeps those populations in check. So you, uh, is that I'm going to extrapolate here. You shouldn't use insecticide on trees, or is that too broad of a statement? That's too broad of a statement. You want to use the right insecticides at the right time. Uh, for example, I manage an orchard for com commercial use. It's a family orchard. And originally, um, my dad used a spray schedule that other orchardists around the area were using. And I was kind of flabbergasted because they were spraying at least 18, 19 times a year. Is this apples? Apples. Mm -hmm. So what is that doing to our natural born predators that actually prey upon the insects that I don't want? So I had my dad scale back insecticides for multiple reasons and changed it to dormant oils in the winter time and I've got him knock, knocked down now to 10 sprays. Still can't get him to go further but um, <laughs> our apples look just as good as they did. So it says a lot to me that um, letting that good, good predator base fill up and, and control your bad ones makes a big difference. So. And let's not forget our feathered friends that really like to eat little, little bugs. Yeah, well. they're helping you out too. So, any other questions on that? Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is protecting the root zone. It's all about the roots to me. Um, <clears throat> good rule of thumb is one foot radius for each inch of trunk diameter. And trees larger than 30 inches in diameter, you want to go one and a half foot. There's a six inch tree and there's your six foot radius of protected root zone. Not necessarily going to be feasible in all environments, especially in your urban canopy, but um, will definitely make a difference no matter how much root system you can protect. So I know that was a lot of stuff in a short amount of time and, and I'm here for questions if needed. Anybody have any? Could you yes. go back to your tree defense slide, your tree defense compound slide? Yes. Yeah, I kind of went through that um, pretty quick. I mean, going through um, yeah, going the, the list? Yeah, there you go, like four items. Oh, I mean, the resin, the okay. And I have my business card up here. I didn't bring any brochures with me. But if you need help diagnosing, have any questions, want a copy of my PowerPoint, please feel free to call me or email me. There it is. Is this the one? Yes. Okay. 
Thanks, guys. No more questions? Okay. Thank you.